Are you comfortable with mystery? Not knowing everything you could know about something? Uh, human beings, we have this insatiable need to know things, to understand things, to, to pick apart things, to understand exactly how everything works. I don't know about you, but I have this problem. I'm a thinker. I love to learn. And I will sometimes get to this unhealthy place where I have to understand something. And I tell myself, if I just understood why this happened, or if I understood how this worked, then I would be okay. Maybe you can relate to that, uh, but that's a lie. Because there is a limit to all knowledge. And at some point, every one of us, no matter what we believe in, we come to the limit of our knowledge, and we have to make a decision what we're going to place our faith in, what we're going to trust. And for the believer, we put our ultimate trust in God. And when there's something we don't understand, we don't understand how it works, we say, I'm going to trust God and his word and his goodness for me. But for an atheist, for example, they're going to put their faith ultimately in man and man's ability to understand through the sciences or through whatever endeavors they take that somehow they're going to eventually be able to understand. And so really, at the end of the day, we're either trusting in God or we're trusting in man. And today, we are going to look at uh, the mystery of how God works in us. And it's one of the most profound and uh, one of the most interesting sections of Scripture that we're going to look at today. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 2, verses uh, 12 to 18. And today, as we look at this, we're going to be talking about theology. Now, if you love theology, today is your day, because we're going to talk about some robust theological concepts. And if you don't love theology, let me just plead with you for a second that theology absolutely matters. What we believe about God, which is what theology is, it's the study of God. What we believe about God determines how we live. What we believe about God determines how we live. And when we come and we look at how God operates in our lives, at some point we come upon the mystery of God. And what I want to suggest today is we have to be okay with mystery. God does not tell us how everything works and I remember as a young Christian, uh, because I was a learner, because I was a thinker, I wanted to understand how this all worked. And as I've grown in my walk, I've become more and more comfortable with the mysteries of God. And one of those mysteries we're going to look at today. How is it that God works in us, yet we're still responsible for how we operate? Let me go ahead and read our section of Scripture, and then I'll pray for us. Uh, and then we'll begin unpacking it. So again, Philippians 2, uh, verses 12 to 18. I'll be reading from the Christian Standard uh, Bible today. It says this, Therefore, my dear friends, let me, let me just pause for one second, because I love what Paul does here. Paul is just talking with a deep affection. He says, my dear friends. The Greek there is my beloved. And so again, we see that Paul has a deep and abiding relationship with the Philippians. And I just want to say, if you're going to talk theology with anyone, the relationship you have with them really matters. As the old, old saying goes, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so let's let relationships be the foundation for any theological discussion we get in. Sorry, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't not talk about that. Let me just read the scripture. Therefore, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but even more, in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. But even if I am poured out as a drink offering on the sacrificial service of your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. In the same way, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together. 
Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have a relationship with us. And as we look into your word today and we try to unpack some of the deep and rich, mysterious theological concepts, would you just bless us with your presence, with your peace? God, I just, I just want to lift up our nation in particular. As Mike and I shared earlier this, this week, as we look at uh, the racial tension uh, that we're all experiencing again. God, we just pray for truth and for justice, and we pray for, the, for relationships to be established, that we could have meaningful conversations, that we could have not just monologue but dialogue. And so we pray for our country yet again that you would heal this land. God, we love you. We give you this time. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come now and move powerfully in your word. And we pray all this in your name, Jesus, and by your spirit. Amen. Well, let's look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 here. Let me just say this right off the bat. These are two verses that need to always, always, always be read together. If you, uh, if you don't take them together, you're going to fall in one of two errors. If you just look at verse 12, where it tells us to work out our salvation, you may fall into a works righteousness theology that says, I have to work for my righteousness. On the other hand, if you just look at verse 13, which says God's working in us, then you may fall into spiritual laziness. And that's just as dangerous. And so we're going to unpack these. We're going to look at these together. But let's look at this text together. And I want to ask you a question here at home. We'll try this. Uh, I want you to just look over this verse and talk with your uh, friend or your uh, spouse or whoever there is with you. Uh, I want you to identify two, two of the most important words you think are in this text. So I'll give you just a moment to look at that, maybe chat with your, uh, your friend or your spouse. There. What two words do you think are most important in this text? All right, I'm going to tell you what I think. I think two of the most important words in this text are right here. Number one, therefore. And number two, for. And these two words are connecting these verses together. And that helps us understand what they mean and how they relate to one another. So let's start with the first one. It says, therefore. Now, there's this old saying, which I'm going to cringe even as I say it. Whenever you see a therefore in the Bible, you're supposed to ask, what is the therefore? Therefore. Maybe some of you said that with me as I said that. What is the therefore, therefore? Well, therefore means, based on what I have just said, based on what we just look like, looked at, in light of that, you need to respond in this way. Well, what did we just look at? Last week, we ended by looking at what's called the great hymn of Christ, Philippians 2, verses 5 to 11. And in that, we saw this beautiful and magnificent picture of who God is in Christ and what he did. And what we saw was this, that Jesus... Uh, existed as the second person of the Trinity. He was the Son of God. And then Jesus, who was the highest of highs, he came and he put on human flesh in what's called the incarnation in the man of Jesus. And as Jesus, as God in the flesh, he lived a life of perfect obedience to the Father's will. And he was so obedient that it actually led to his death. And we saw that it was not just any death, but death on a cross. And we saw that, that he did this, he lived an obedient life, and he died for our disobedience. And on the cross, that Jesus took our sin upon himself, and he gave us his righteousness. And then we saw that God raised him from the dead, and exalted him to the highest of highs, and he gave him the name that is above every name. And we saw that one day, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, what? That Jesus is Lord. And we ended with the fact that everyone, one day, will acknowledge that. The question is, will we do it willingly, or will we do it unwillingly? So what hap what's happening here is Paul is saying, in light of the gospel, in light of what I've just said, in light of who Jesus is and what he's done, therefore, live in this way. What does he say? What is the call? Simply this. It is a call to obey. obedience. Let's look at uh, verse 12 here again. It says, therefore, my dear friends... Just as you have always obeyed here, so he says obeyed, so now work out your own salvation. So just as you have always obeyed, and then he switches the terminology, and he says work out your own salvation. In other words, obedience looks like working out your own salvation. Now maybe you say, 
well, hold on a second. What do you mean work out our salvation? I know my Bible. I know Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, which says we are saved by grace through faith, not of our own works. What is this that he's talking about? Work out your salvation. Well, this is why we need to pay attention and stick with this word for. And for means this, because of. This, is, this next statement is the basis for the statement I just said. In other words, you can work out your salvation for this reason, because or for it is God who is working in you. You can work out your salvation because God is working in you. Now we begin to approach the mystery and say, what does that mean that God is working in me? And, and what does it mean that I'm working, but God is working in me? So here's a quick way to look at these verses. We need to work out what God is working in us. We need to work out what God is working in us. You say, what does that mean? What does that look like? Let me tell you, I don't know. I don't ultimately know what this looks like. It's a mystery. And nobody knows what this actually looks like. And we, don't, and, and we don't have to know how it is that God's actually doing this. All we need to know is that God is, in fact, doing it. And we can rest in that fact. And so when we're able to let go of our insatiable need to know, we can rest in the fact that God's word tells us that God is working in us. And we can trust in that. Okay, so we need to work out what God is working in us. Now, mysteries, like, these, this isn't a strange thing. I mean, let's just talk about a physical example, right? When you think in your, um, when you decide, I want to drink a water, and you go and you pick up a glass of water, you take a drink, is it your hand that's doing that? Is it your muscles? Is it your mind? Or is it, of course, it's all of those things. But what was it that drove you to want a drink? What drove your desires? What's actually going on in your mind that caused you to want to do that? And so I don't know if you've studied cognitive uh, processes or, or uh, neurophysiology or anything like that, but the fact is this. We don't actually know how the mind works. It's extremely complex. But we don't have to know how the mind works. We only need to know that it works. And so we don't go around wondering, oh, how does my mind work so I can operate in my normal day? We assume we're okay that it works, and we get on with our life. So, too, when we think about how God works in us, we don't have to sit there and figure out how he does it. We just need to trust that he is doing it. And what happens is very smart people will spend a lot of their lives trying to explain this, and this, and you go beyond what the Bible actually is telling you. And so let's just pull back and go, we can trust that God's working in us. We don't need to know about it. But that being said, what can we know about how God is working in us. And moreover, why does it matter that we know this? So let's look at, um, let's look at verse 12 here, and let's do a little bit of theology. Maybe some of you are getting excited. What does Paul mean by salvation? How can he say, work out your salvation? So we need to make a couple distinctions here. And let's talk about this word or this concept, salvation. Now, the New Testament uses this word all over the place, and it simultaneously uses this word in three senses, uh, in, in the sense that it has already happened. It's something that has happened. It's in the past. That it is something that is happening. It's in the present. And that it is something that will eventually happen. It's in the future. So when the Bible talks about salvation, when Paul talks about salvation, he uses it in all three of these aspects, past, present, and future. Let me give you one verse just to illustrate this. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. Here's what we read. Now, I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preached to you, past tense, which you received, past tense, on which you have taken your stand, present tense, and by which you are being saved, present tense, but indicating a future salvation. So even in this one verse, we begin to see that Paul uses this word in a very interesting way. Now, one distinction that's going to be helpful is the distinction between justification and salvation. Now, the two are connected, absolutely, but they are distinct in what they mean. So what does justification mean? Justification in the Bible simply means this, to be declared righteous in the sight of God. To be declared right in the sight of God. In other words, when we believed in Jesus, the Bible says we were justified in him. Meaning now that when God looks at us, 
He sees the life that Jesus lived, not the life that we lived. We have been made right. We have been declared righteous. It's a legal term. It's a legal notion. We've been acquitted of all sin. God does not see sin. He does not see guilt. He does not see condemnation when he looks at us. He sees his beloved son, Jesus. God loves you with the love that he has loved Jesus with. This is the beauty of the gospel. This is justification. Let's look at a couple of verses just to illustrate this for you. Romans 5.1, very simply, Paul says, we have been justified by faith. We have been declared right by faith. Or a couple verses later, Romans 5.9 says, since therefore we have now been justified, made right, declared righteous by his blood, much more shall we be saved, there's our words for salvation there, by him uh, from the wrath of God. So even in this verse, we see how Paul's making a distinction. We have been justified, uh, but we will be saved. And so justification, in some sense, is the beginning of our salvation. It's a one-time event that happens when we believe in Jesus. When we put our faith in Jesus, we are justified before God. So it is the, the past, kind of looking past, it is the beginning of salvation. Now, let's look at uh, another verse here. Because justification and salvation, they form an unbroken chain. But let's look at Romans 8.30. It's going to uh, expand it even wider. Here's what it says. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. There's our word. And those he justified, he also glorified. Notice there's, there's no verbiage in there about salvation, but there's this unbreakable chain. Those whom he justified, he also glorified. And what glorification is, is when Jesus comes back, as we saw last week, when everyone's going to, and when every knee's going to bow, every tongue's going to confess that Jesus is Lord, everyone's going to know who Jesus is, that is when we will enter into a glorified state. And what this means, it's the completion of salvation. It's when salvation will become complete. When Jesus comes back, we will be finally and fully saved. So here we go. Justification is the beginning of salvation. Glorification is the end of salvation or the completion of salvation. So these are how the two are connected. Now, what does this mean for the middle, which is where we all live, which is where Philippians uh, 2.12 is referring to, working out, present tense, your salvation. How is it that we are working out our salvation? Well, in one sense, when we look back to our justification, it's already been done. We've already been declared what God is going to do. And so we can find rest in that, and we can look back to Philippians 1, 6, that says, where Paul says he's confident that God is going to bring to completion that which he began in the Philippians. And then because we look forward to glorification, the complete salvation, we can rest assured, again, that it's going to happen. Again, that God's going to bring it to pass. And so we get to, 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 uh, to live in a state of rest, that everything is done through and for God. He started it. He's going to complete it. But he's also right here in the middle of it with us. So what does this look like for us? How do we work out our salvation? Now, let's go back to last week. We said this, all true change happens through the heart. This is what we said. And we quoted Thomas Cramner, who was an uh, English reformer, and he said, what the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justified. And you can take it one step further. And, and that's how we live our lives, based on what our heart loves, our, our will chooses, and our mind justifies is how we live our life. So let's talk about one more theological concept that's going to help us understand what this means to work out our salvation. And it is the concept of regeneration. So not just have we been justified, but we have been regenerated. We say, what does that mean? Um, it means that the Holy Spirit came in and regenerated our hearts, that God gave us a new heart through the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit. Let me prove it to you. Ezekiel 36, 26, hundreds of years before this, here's what God promised through the prophet Ezekiel. He says this, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove your heart of stone, your hard heart, your heart that is uh, impenetrable, that does not respond to God, that does not love God, and I will give you a heart of flesh, a living heart. And so God promised through Ezekiel hundreds of years before that this was going to happen. God was going to come in and do the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit and give people a new 
hard. It's the same thing that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus about in John 3. Remember that? Nicodemus, the religious leader, he comes out. He's talking to Jesus, and Jesus says, look, unless you're born again, unless you're born from above, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And Nicodemus has no idea what he's talking about. And so Jesus says, look, you have to be born of the Spirit. You have to be born of the Spirit. He's talking about the miracle of the new birth, of the regeneration that happens when the Holy Spirit comes in and changes someone's heart and makes it alive. So God gives us that new heart with new affections, with new desires, from which we make new decisions. And we think new thoughts, and therefore we live differently. So God comes in through the Holy Spirit and regenerates our hearts, because what the heart loves, the will chooses. So now we have a new heart with new affections, with new loves. Now, how is it that God then is working? Let's go back and look at uh, our verse again, Philippians 2, 12 and 13. And let me just underline two more words for you. Here's how God's working. It says, for God is at work in you. He's working in you to do what? Both, uh, remember, both here, to will and to work. Interesting. Now, both of these words are in the present tense, indicating uh, a present ongoing action. So what is God doing? He is working in us to will and to work. What do we mean by will? This word means our desires, our longings, what we wish for, what we long for. So God has given us a new heart, and now he's working in us this new will, these new desires. And he's doing, through, doing it through the Holy Spirit. And so we're, our, our desires are literally being changed by the new heart that God gave us. Isn't that amazing? And then what follows? Well, the work we do. Just as we were saying, a new heart, new desires, means we live a new way. So God is working in us through the new heart, new desires, and a new way to live. And so let's talk about one more thing here that we need. So we talked about justification. We talked about the Holy Spirit coming in through regeneration, but he doesn't just leave us then. Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit is indwelling all who have believed in Jesus. Jesus teaches this in John 14. He says, you have known the Holy Spirit. He's going to be in you. And then again, if we look back at Ezekiel 36, 26, he says what? I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. That's Holy Spirit. Let's look at Romans 5, 5. We've been in Romans 5 a little bit today. It also says the same thing, Romans 5, 5. God's love has been poured out into our hearts, our new heart there, regeneration, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So as believers, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. It is the Holy Spirit that is the active agent that is changing us from the inside out. Okay? This is how God is working in us that which we are working out, working out our salvation. A new heart, new affections, new desires. And just a side note here, this is why prayer is so important. In Romans 8, we read that the Holy Spirit prays even when we don't know how to pray. But what does prayer do? It's not so much about changing God's mind. It's that our minds and our hearts are being changed to be more like God's. Our wills, our desires are being aligned to that which God wants and God desires. You say, well, what does God desire? Well, notice it says here that he does all this according to his good purposes, it says. That word can mean pleasure. So God's doing all of this out of his goodness, out of his good pleasure, out of his good purposes. Well, what are the purposes of God? You know what they are? That all would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. That all would become the people of God. God says in Ezekiel 33, 11, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Oh, but that people would turn from their evil ways. Or 2 Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord's patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but that all would come to repentance. And this is what we're here for. So listen to this. How God is willing and working in you, how you're working out your salvation will actually lead to other people coming to know Jesus and experiencing salvation. This is God's will. This is what God is after. It's why we're still here. And so here's the mission of God, even embedded right here. And this is the work of God, changing in us through the Holy Spirit. Now, let's look at um, what this means for us. So Galatians 5, for example, says that we need to walk by the Spirit. 
that we need to keep in step with the Spirit. So what does this look like for us? How do we keep in step with the Spirit? Well, let's just look at the next couple verses here. Uh, Philippians 2, 14 to 16. Here's what it says. Do everything without grumbling and arguing, so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. Then I can boast in the day of Christ that I didn't run or labor for nothing. What does it look like to walk by the Spirit? Well, if you read Galatians 5, which is similar to what this is saying, this says, um, do everything out, uh, without grumbling or arguing, indicating a hardness of heart. If you were to look at Galatians 5, it has this, uh, this great section about how we're all at war with each other, the, the, uh, within ourselves, that, that, that the, the desires of the flesh are against um, the desires of the Spirit. So you have the works of the flesh contrasted against the fruit of the Spirit. And then Paul tells us in Galatians 5 that we need to walk by the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit. And so this is saying the same thing here. And so what this means is we need to, number one, we need to live a, li a self-examined life. We need to pay attention to how it is we are living. So Paul says here, do everything without grumbling or arguing. So we could ask ourselves, are we living lives that are grumbling or argumentative for argument's sake? And this language, uh, the commentators point out, uh, is very similar to the language of the Israelites when they're in the wilderness. You know, we just did the Exodus where they cross the Red Sea and then they're the nation of Israel. And then we read about all the grumbling and they're grumbling against God. And because of their grumbling and their hardness of heart, Scripture says they missed out on the promised land. And so it's a warning for us. What is the condition of our heart? Is my heart hard? Is my heart responding to God, to God's word, to the Holy Spirit? If, if, is my life changing? Is my life being conformed to the life of Jesus? Both the heart of Jesus and the life of Jesus. Scripture wants us to examine our hearts. And when we read Scripture, which we'll read about in a second, it's not so much that we read Scripture, it's that Scripture reads us. And this is what we need. So we need to examine where our hearts are at. And if we are not changing over time, then we need to take heed and consider what is our relationship with Jesus really like? And what do we need to do? How do we need to respond? This is why earlier it said fear and trembling. So you got to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. What does this mean? Does this mean we need to be afraid of God? No, what it means is we need to, to live a life of sobriety. We have to approach our life with soberness and, and, and the, the severity of God, that it matters how we live. It matters how we live. And if our lives are not changing, if they're not being transformed, if we're not loving God and Jesus more and loving ourselves less, something's off. And I'm not talking about a week. I'm not talking about a day. I'm talking over the course of years if we're not changing. We need to take heed. We need to look at that. We need to examine our hearts. And so how do we do this? Second thing I'll say is we've got to utilize the tools that God has given us. So to ask how are we working at our salvation, another way to ask that is how do I grow? This is a process of sanctification, no theological concept. That we become more like Christ is the process of sanctification. And I always say there's three things we need to grow. I hope you get tired of me saying this, but it, you know, when we think about what does it mean to be the Christian life, it, it, there really is a simplicity to it. We need God's word, we need God's spirit, and we need God's people. We need these three ingredients to grow in the Christian life. So let's look at this, because we see these in the text. It says uh, in Philippians 2.16 that we got to hold firm to the word of life. What is the word of life? Well, this is the scriptures. It is the scriptures in general, and it is the gospel in particular. And so when we look to the scriptures, it tells us how God wants us to live, his desire for our lives. But when we fail to live up to that, the gospel, scripture in particular, the gospel reminds us that everywhere we have disobeyed and fallen short, Christ has obeyed for us. And Christ has more than filled in the gaps. That his grace uh, overpowers even our sin. And so we are reminded that 
we have been saved, that we have been justified, that we have been regenerated, that we have the Holy Spirit within us, that we are indwelt by God's Spirit, which is the second thing we need, God's Spirit. So if you don't feel a uh, love for God's Word, and again, I, I always want to say, look, we have an enemy who does not want us to go to the Word of Life. It's the Word of Life because it's the only place we get life, spiritual life, which is what our souls need most, spiritual nourishment. And so if you don't have a love for Scripture, if you struggle reading the Bible, reading God's Word, the words of life, if they're not life to you, ask the Holy Spirit to come. The Holy Spirit inspired Scripture, and the Holy Spirit will illuminate Scripture and apply it to your life. Jesus tells us all we have to do is ask for the Spirit, and he'll give it. So when we're stuck, when we're not feeling the affections toward God, ask the Holy Spirit. That's what he's there for. That's how he's working in us. God, would you change me? This may mean that the Holy Spirit comes and convicts us of sin. Because you know what? Sin is a hindrance to enjoying the blessing of God. And so he invites us to confess, invites us to live in community, God's people. So let me ask you this. Do you know the voice of the Holy Spirit? Do you know the voice of the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit, uh, the voice is, is never one of condemnation. It's always one of invitation. It always is inviting you back to the cross, inviting you back to the Father, inviting you to confess your sin, inviting you to live in the light, inviting you to be in community with God's people, inviting you to enjoy uh, Scripture. Do you know the voice of the Holy Spirit? And the last thing we see is God's people. We need God's people in our lives. Guess what? God's people are also indwelt by God's Spirit. So all these things are coming together. And here at One Hope, we believe in community. We believe community exists to bring these three things together, God's Word, God's Spirit, and God's people. And when they come together, powerful things happen. Here at One Hope, we believe our vision for community groups is this. They'd be environments of Jesus-centered, spirit-filled, intentional relationships to form us to be more like Christ. And we've laid out values of biblical community because this is what we need in our lives. We need to live in a posture of authenticity. We need to let people know what's going on in our lives. This means confession. This means being known. Again, this is all based on relationships, right? We've got to pursue each other relationally. One of our other uh, values, that we need established relationships. Remember what Paul said, my dear friends. The relationship was the context for applying theology to your life. So we want to pursue each other relationally. We need to counsel each other biblically. We need to know the word of God, the words of life, and say, here's what the Bible would have to say to you. Here's what God's word says. Sometimes we need to be admonished. We need to be corrected and turned away from harmful things. And sometimes we need to be encouraged to, towards good things. This all comes from the Bible. It has a lot to say. We need to be reminded of the gospel, of who Jesus is and what he's done for us and how we are free from condemnation. That the voice you're hearing is not the voice of God. It's not the voice of the Spirit. So we need to be in community with one another. And when we do that, I mean, this is the definition of the church. Centered on God's word, filled with God's spirit, and together as God's people. This text says that we will shine like the stars in a crooked and perverted generation. And these words mean a generation that twists and turns God's word. And no matter what generation you live in, our generation, the same in, in Paul's day, that there are those who are opposed to the truth, that are opposed to the word of God, and they twist it and they turn it. We're here to shine like lights into the darkness as we cling to the words of life. So what does this mean for you? How do we work out our salvation? Because God is working in us. I mean, three questions. Where is God's word in your life? Where is God's spirit in your life? And where are God's people in your life? We can really help you with this last one. We want you to be connected here at One Hope Church. Let me tell you, just because we are in Lockdown and social distancing doesn't mean we can't be in community. Listen to me. The church is first and foremost a spiritual community. We are all united together by the Spirit of Christ. 
I think it was last week we talked about, is there any fellowship in the Spirit? Are we united in Spirit? We are. We don't have to be physically present to be spiritually present. So I want to encourage you to get connected in a group here. Get to know some people. This is what you were made for. This is what we need to experience life. It's what we need to work out salvation. In fact, when Paul gives this um, uh, exhortation, he says, work, he's, saying, he's saying it to the Philippians. He's saying, y'all, work out y'all's salvation. It's plural. Everyone, we need God's people to do this. So would you join We've got opportunities. You can join today, right after this, in our post-service Zoom gathering. Come and be known. Say hello. If you don't know anyone, get connected here. Join us on Wednesday night as we're going over the reason for God, talking about some theological uh, issues. It's been a lot of fun. You're welcome to just jump in and do that. We've got groups that are meeting that would love for you to join a part of that. Fill out a Connect card today and say, hey, help me get connected here. We want to help you because we believe this is vital to what it means to be the church. So I'm going to leave you with that. Let me go ahead and pray for us, and we will continue to worship. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this word. I thank you for the study of you, the theology of our love for you, because you have loved us so greatly. I pray right now that you would, <laughs> that you would move people towards each other, out of the, the lethargy of this crazy, weird world we're living in, to get connected, to get into your word and experience life through the power of your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, would you go now and do your work right now? For those that are hearing this, would you break through any hard hearts? Would you comfort anyone who is um, discouraged? And God, I just think specifically for our families, I, I know this is, this can be hard, and community can be hard. So I would just God, would you move our families, maybe just towards one family, one other family, and just start doing life together. God, I pray that you would help us to be your church and experience true life. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in your name and by your spirit.